we're all familiar with curriculum and perhaps curriculum design, the design of individual curriculum components. But there's also curriculum architecture, the specification of a learning continuum or a training and development path or what's known nowadays as a learning path. There's curriculum architecture design that goes beyond the development of a learning path and involves an enterprise curriculum architecture. These are the topics for this video. PACT is an engineering approach or an architectural approach to instruction and information. PACT is an acronym performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven training and development of any blend. There are three levels of instructional design impact. Curriculum architecture design, modular curriculum development, which is the ADI equivalent on the PAC processes, and instructional activity development, which is a subset or develops components of traditional instruction. It's a subset of the modular curriculum development methodologies. All of this is aimed and targeted at producing performance competence, which in our terms is defined as the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. Stakeholder requirements impact both the tasks and the outputs of performance. There are seven business reasons for embracing the PAC processes. The first and most important is increased performance impact of the instructional and informational products. PACT also increases modular design reuse, which by itself then reduces development time and costs, inventory system costs, administrative systems costs, deployment systems costs, and maintenance system costs, affecting the reduction of the life cycle costs for the products of information and instruction. I was a co-author of the first reference to curriculum architecture published in Training Magazine in September 1984. Two months later, my partners and I produced the first article on performance modeling and knowledge and skill analysis and our methods that later became the PAC processes. In April of 1985 at the NSPI conference, I presented the first national presentation about curriculum architecture design via a group process. The fall previous to this, I had presented this same presentation at the Chicago chapter of NSPI at their fall conference. My book, Lean ISD, was published in 1999. It had started in 1983 as the Curriculum Manager's Handbook. The late Dr. Gary Rumler wrote a very nice review of both the book and the methodology, as well as he redesigned the cover of the book, and this is that cover. Lean ISD was the recipient in 2002 of an ISPI Award of Excellence in Instructional Communication. In 2011, I updated Lean ISD and two other books and created this six-pack. We'll discuss these specific books later in the video. The pack processes. Five methodology sets, including three levels of instructional design, curriculum architecture, modular curriculum development, instructional activity development, which are all supported by a common set of analysis methodologies and tools, and a common set of project planning and management tools. Three levels of design and common analysis and project management. 
These are the five key elements of the PAC processes. Let's start by looking at curriculum architecture design. My experience with curriculum architecture design goes back to my very first project in 1982 with Exxon's USA Exploration Group. We were looking at the knowledge and skill requirements of geologists and geophysicists who were exploring for oil in the sands of West Texas, in the Rocky Mountains, in the tundra of Alaska, and offshore. The CAD methodology is applicable to any industry. This is my curriculum architecture design POTS chart. Phases, outputs, and teams. In the first phase, project planning and kickoff, a project plan and price is put together for the client and is reviewed in the project steering team meeting typically a half day. All of the issues going forward, all of the sensitivities of the project steering team are brought to the fore and amended into the project plan. That leads to an analysis effort where four types of analysis are conducted. A target audience analysis, an analysis of the performance, an analysis of the enabling knowledge and skills, and an assessment of all the existing content to see what might be reused. That's the result of an analysis team meeting that typically lasts somewhere between two and four days. A full day is dedicated by the project steering team to review all of that data to ensure that it is exactly what they want the performance to be going forward. Once that passes the gate review, in the third phase, design, a training and development path is created and in a planning guide. Gaps are specified at two levels, events and modules. This is the result of a two to four day design team meeting. In phase four implementation planning, all of the gaps are prioritized and the maintenance for reuse of content after modification is prioritized. Costs are put to that and a priority cost forecast is created. This is the result of a one to two day implementation planning team meeting and a half day review with the project steering team. The key outputs of a CAD effort include that project plan that is predictable in terms of the cycle time, the burden on each participant in the project, and the schedule as well as the cost. In the analysis phase, one or more target audiences are looked at, their performance is modeled, the enabling knowledge and skills are matrixed against that performance, and all existing content that's appropriate to be reviewed is assessed for its potential reuse in the curriculum going forward. In the design phase, module specifications are created for all of the content. That's inventoried in a five-tier inventory framework, which we'll discuss later. All of those modules are rolled up into events. Modules are the equivalent of chapters of the books of events. All of that is laid out in a path or continuum and a planning guide is put together to reflect the learning and development path. Because a curriculum architecture design does not produce any new content, it simply identifies what the performance-based requirements are, reconciles all existing content, and identifies the gaps. Gap priorities can be established for going forward. This is an example of a training and development path, or what our client called a leadership and management development path. Associated with this path is a planning guide. The path is a marketing poster. The planning guide helps bring it home to the project steering team 
and all managers who would be planning training for their staff. Consideration is given to each event on the path due to its recommendation of being mandatory, highly recommended, or an elective. This training and development path was for consumer sales associates. This path was one of seven of this project. On these paths are these two traffic lights which is where testing was going to happen to determine whether the learners or a learner would be able to continue down the path. If they were unsuccessful in passing the tests at this juncture, they would be washed out of the program. The client also had a need for determining when people were ready to be released from training due to production volumes in the call center and where they might be able to come out and help without hurting the operation. These red W's signify points where the learner was prepared to be released from training temporarily to help out with production needs. This was unique to this particular client and isn't typical of the training and development paths that I have been producing since 1982. This next training and development path was produced after a Six Sigma project created a global process for the client. This path is multiple phases and offers a menu of content to the learners. What's unique about this particular path is all of these events in the blue area at the bottom were really content that could have been put in the very first phase. However, the client was very sensitive to the type of training that was offered in that section and wanted to remove it from the key path. Things such as using Word and Excel and things that they thought were really of kind of low value but were truly foundational and they didn't want to gunk up the front end of the path because of how their executive management might react to that. So all of that content that could have been in the very first phase in block zero in this path was put at the bottom as a foundation to the path. This curriculum was designed as a series of modules and events starting with the 1000 series, the 2000 series, and the 3000 series. Think of this as basic and intermediate and advanced. This project was first done in 1986, however this particular path was based on a revisiting of the curriculum due to the changes in this particular business and their processes and was refreshed in 1989. The very first blue box, the very first event on this path, was a video that was 11 minutes long. This video is posted online, it might be of interest to you to review this. The next blue box that's circled in red is a module that was a 100-page novel of two fictitious product planners going to work for this group, and it told the story of their first year on the job. This was used as an advanced organizer for all of the learners to begin to grapple with the complexity the chaotic nature of the world of work for product managers in this particular business. The next module was an orientation that was a do-it-yourself approach where people, the learners, went around and interviewed their managers to determine what their products were that they were responsible for, how these products fit within other systems that were being sold. It was to demystify the complexity of their products that they would be responsible for as product planners and product managers. The next module was a demystification, do it yourself, of your job. What elements of product management were you going to be responsible for? Would you be doing the financial planning associated with a product or a product family? Would you be doing the engineering planning? the manufacturing planning, 
the sales planning, the product support planning, etc. The job was very complex and of the 1,100 people in the product management target audience, it's almost fair to say that no two jobs were alike. They were different configurations of eight different major functions that we were able to break the product management job down into. The 1000 series culminated at the very end with an eight-day training course that I delivered 31 times for this client, including five times in the Netherlands for their international operations. This was intended to bring all of the short modules, which were typically 15 minutes to a half an hour in length, and not everybody would take anything because they came from one of five business units, but sometimes somebody in one business unit would only need to know about their business unit and didn't need to know about the four other business units. Others work with other business units and may need to learn about their business unit and two or three or four of the other business units depending on their job and their product and how it fit into the overall system of telecommunications products that this organization was responsible for. They were managing 500,000 distinct orderable products for the telecommunications industry. CAD has four phases. If you take a close look at this graphic, you'll see that the traffic light is turned upside down. That's because we wanted it to be not a stop light, but a go light. At each of the gate review meetings of the project steering team at the conclusion of each phase, there were four key decisions that the project steering team could make. First of all, they could kill the project because it no longer made business sense. Second, they could defer the project because it was now untimely for some reason. Third, they could modify the plan or the data that we had to that point and then allow us to go forward. Fourth, they could approve the plan and the data that we had in hand from that phase's efforts and sanction us into moving forward. As we told the client, ISD, the instructional designers, own the process, but the client owns the content. They own the content of the plan, they own the content of all of the data, analysis and design and otherwise, and they own the content of all decisions, the business decisions that were inherent in every instructional design project, and they actually could override all of the instructional design decisions inherent in every instructional design project. Typical questions that come up about the four phases of a curriculum architecture design project is that, yes, phases can be combined. The typical cycle time for conducting one of these projects is somewhere between four and six weeks. It really always depended on the ability for the project steering team to come together in a timely fashion. If projects took longer than four weeks, it was because the project steering team and all of the members necessary could not be brought together in a meeting to conduct their reviews. These projects can be done in as little as five days if everyone, and I mean everyone, that's required can participate the entire time. That would include the people that would typically be on a project steering team, the client and the key stakeholders, the master performers and others who would be on the analysis and design teams, and perhaps somebody from the financial organization to be involved in the implementation planning and the costing out of going forward and implementing and addressing the gaps of the curriculum. Let's focus in on design now. In the design team meeting, there are seven steps that are followed. The design team is a subset of the analysis team. So they're already familiar with all of the analysis data that was produced that articulated the target audience, the performance that was required of the target audience, the enabling knowledge and skills. What would be new to them is what existing content do we have that we can work with. 
So the first order of business in, ter in terms of the design team meeting is to demystify the entire project and the process for this particular phase, for this particular meeting. We would establish the training and development path. How long might this take? And you'll see on the table here in the graphic, there's a beginning and a middle and an end, a B and M and an E. What do we mean by the beginning? When will that end, etc.? And so we all come to have a shared understanding about this path and how we're going to begin to sort some of the data. Once we've established the path and how long it is in its totality and when does the beginning end and how long might somebody take in this and discuss all of that to create a shared understanding across the entire design team, we would then begin to sort the performance data. When will we teach this part of the performance that comes out of the performance model data. Would that begin in the beginning, the middle, or the end, and etc. We take all the performance, all the tasks and outputs, and all the data that we have associated with that, and we sort it into the beginning, and middle, and end of the path. We would next look at all the existing content, now that we've anchored the training and development path with the performance, and where the learners are going to learn how to perform, we would take all the existing training that's been assessed to be reused as is, and we would sort it accordingly on the path and demonstrate how we were going to reuse existing content. So we would place the as-is content on that path. The fourth step is to sort then all of the enabling knowledge and skills. And because all of that enabling knowledge and skills is identified in terms of it enables what performance, we would place that enabling knowledge and skills immediately before the performance that it enables. Now we have all the analysis data that we collected sorted into the path. So there's a couple of steps left. We're going to take all that content and accumulate it into modules, just like chapters in the book or tabs in a binder. What's going to go in the first module, and the second module, and the third module? We take all of that content and create those chapters, if you will, those modules. And then we come back to the beginning of the path and we decide which of these modules go in the various books or units or events. The first module goes in the first event. Does the second module go in that same event, or does that begin a new event? And we give consideration to the learners target audience, and how do we organize this content to make it best fit the learners and their learning requirements. We don't want anybody to have to go through content that they don't need because they already know it or it's not part of their job, and so that drives the modularity and the accumulation of content into modules and more importantly into events. Events are the administratable portion of the curriculum. It's what you would sign up to take. You would sign up to read this book and that book and skip other books and inside are the chapters or the modules in this case. Once we've modularized and eventized all the content, we can go back and clean up the path. We can take our temporary titles that we gave things and do truth in titling. We can estimate the amount of time that each module will take and roll those up to determine how long an event is, etc. An example of this is now on this next graphic. We have the enterprise content architecture on the left. This is the five-tier inventory structure I mentioned earlier. We have the path over on the right, with a beginning and a middle and an end of the path. But each segment, the beginning, has its own beginning and middle and end, the middle has its own beginning and middle and end, and the end has its own beginning and middle and end. This is necessary to establish to sort all of the content, otherwise it will all front end load because everybody needs everything right away, although that's not necessarily true. So once we establish how long is the beginning, is this beginning of the past something that we expect the learner, the typical learner, to complete in one day, two days, two weeks, two months, what? And so we establish that for the onboarding 
portion. If we're going to onboard something and teach them everything that they need, orient them to the job and the organization and their teams and all of that, and give them the immediate survival skills, how long might that take? And so we have to guess as a group. Two days, two weeks, two months, what? So once we've established how long it is to get to the point where we're at the green box at the end of the beginning, then we can begin to talk about, well, how long might it take the learner to get through the middle of the path? What does that mean to us collectively as a group? Is that the next two months, or does that take us through the first year, and then the end is really everything after the first year? It always varies across each target audience, but I found over the years that master performers that are brought together to make these decisions on behalf of their organization have a really good feel and easily come to consensus on how long the beginning of a path would take somebody to go through, ideally. How long might it take them to go through the middle of the path there? And at what point might they start and end the end of the path? The five-tier inventory has organizational orientations in Tier 1. Welcome to the company, welcome to the business unit, welcome in orientation to the uh, division, to the function, to the department, welcome to your job, welcome to all the various teams that you're going to be supporting and working with. And that's the content that typically goes at the beginning of the beginning. It's the welcome to where you are, a cog in the great big machinery of this company, and here's where you are, and here's where everything else sits, and now you can see where you sit inside the organization. The next part of the five-tier inventory structure is Tier 2, performance orientations. In Tier 1, we already introduced you to your job, but now we're going to take a next deeper dive. If the job was about doing development of instruction, we might have covered Addy. And if you also were going to be doing delivery, we would cover the equivalent of doing the preparation, setting up the room or classroom or whatever, uh, delivering that, doing all the cleanup afterwards, whatever that entails for the job. So here in Tier 2, we're going to do deeper dives on all of that and demystify it. This is where advanced organizers go. If we're following ADDI, then what does that A stand for? It's analysis. Okay, so what do we really do in analysis? What are the outputs? What are the inputs? What are the process tasks? Who else is involved with that? We demystify it. We don't teach people how to do it. We simply tell them what it is. We demystify it and clarify it for them. That's what goes into the middle of the beginning of a path. The next content that's important are the how-to's, of which there are two types. There are shared how-to content, and there are how-to's that are unique to the target audience. We'll come up with some examples and talk about those in just a minute. Tier 3 are all the enabling knowledge and skills. Generic content such as presentation skills and spreadsheet skills and active listening skills and here's a policy and here's a procedure, etc. But those are simply enablers to some terminal performance. But this is where we would store that kind of content. And this is important for later on for reuse. So we might have various content now on the path, on the right, that also would be coming from our inventory on the left. And you can see where the enablers of Tier 3 precede the how-to modules. I might need to learn about spreadsheets before I do a financial plan. So spreadsheets are generic, but doing a financial plan for an instructional product is different than doing a financial plan for other places in the organization. So that would be both a Tier 3 generic enabler and a Tier 5 unique to my job, because nobody else in the company does a financial plan for an instructional design project. Once all of that data is sorted, driven by the analysis data that's actually sorted onto the path, we can begin to modularize that. So which things kind of go together, and it makes sense to package them together into a chapter of a book or a module of an event. And so that's what these red boxes 
suggest that, gee, that's how we might organize that content and put it together. Not everything needs to be a separate deliverable, a separate module. And then the next series of boxes are how we might package them into events. So in this case, there are six events on the path. One big event that comprises the beginning of the path, three in the middle of the path, and two at the end of the path. This is just for illustrative purposes only. Back to this example of the zone manager's development path. There are four phases on this path. The first phase is the, is the immediate survival skills that are necessary. They didn't want to call it onboarding, but they could have done that. That's what onboarding really is. The immediate survival skills so that the person can leave the onboarding portion of their development and go out to the job and start working and then continue the learning through various formal and informal means. On that path are all those events. Some of them already exist. See the availability, the red dot that's full? That one already exists. We've already got it. It's on the path. Not a big deal. The next one, Senior Manager's Orientation for Zone Managers, well, that's partially available with, from our analysis data. We've got some of it, but we don't have ideally what we really truly need. But that's the good news. We've got something. We're not starting at ground zero. That next thing, the how to manage safety for zone managers, we don't have anything. And we also know things about each of these three events. The first one would have been an elective, and it's a classroom lab of 16 hours. We've already got that, so we know that. But it's an elective. Nobody really has to take that, but if you need it, you need it. The next one is mandatory, and it would be structured on the job via a certified coach, not just any coach, but a certified designated coach would have to deliver this one, and it's approximately two hours in length once we put it together. This third one is highly recommended, not mandatory, and not just an elective that you might blow off, but this is something that you should highly consider when you're doing your planning. This also would be structured on the job training via a certified coach, and it would be approximately one hour in length, but we don't have anything for that one at this particular point. If we look at GAC at this path here and this event that's circled in red, it, it doesn't exist at all. The little dot there is blank. So that's an event, and again, every event has at least one module in it. This example has two that are listed on the left-hand side of the event spec, the event specification. The modules inside the event of which there are two, has various content in it. And the content in the boxes, this has been blanked out here, but the content from the analysis, what outputs and tasks are performed, etc., what enabling knowledge and skills, that would all be populated in this module spec or mod spec or module specification. What would go into this chapter of this book, Guy, if we were to actually pay to have this put in place. This is necessary for the project steering team to either do the prioritization or to approve the prioritization, depending on how the project was structured. What do I get if we put this in place? This is important. A curriculum architecture design project at the end has an implementation plan. It understands where are the gaps on the path and what are the priorities for those gaps? If there's a gap and we don't do anything with it, that's what's known as unstructured OJT, unstructured on-the-job training. They'll figure it out. We can at least name it for them, but they'll figure it out by hook or by crook somehow, some way. In today's vernacular, that's known as informal learning. But now it's guided informal learning. Does Guy need to learn about the fax machine? No, we're not going to build any formal content for that. He'll just figure that out there. There's a manual in some drawer someplace, or he'll have to ask the person in the next cube. Curriculum architecture design projects lead to one or many modular curriculum development and instructional activity development projects. 
and that's what's suggested in this particular graphic. The, the implementation planning phase of a curriculum architecture design project allows you to forecast all the projects and all the costs and all the people burden necessary to implement the priorities of the curriculum. Now time for a transition. Let's look at modular curriculum development, which might follow a curriculum architecture design project or might be done without a curriculum architecture design project preceding it. This is my experience in doing modular curriculum development projects using the same kinds of analysis and project planning and management tools from the PAC process. Not all of these were preceded by a curriculum architecture design effort, but many of them were. In a modular curriculum development project, similar to the CAD effort, project planning and kickoff precedes any analysis or design efforts. It's what's missing in the traditional ADDIE view. Same thing, project plan is put together, cost-benefit analysis, cost to go forward, schedules, all that good stuff. A project steering team meets to look at that, review it, decide whether this makes sense to them. They decide who's going to be on the analysis teams, who's going to be in the development teams. If we have to break free resources later on when we do development, who is that going to be? They have to buy into this because there's huge implications for resource consumption from one of these projects. They have to understand that this was a priority for us to address. This isn't just low-hanging fruit. If we have done an analysis and we have analysis from a curriculum architecture design effort, this next phase analysis may be shortcutted or might be skipped entirely because we may already have the analysis data that we need in terms of who is the target audience, what is the performance requirements, what are the enabling knowledge and skills, and do we have any content that already covers any of this? we may already know. If we've done a curriculum architecture design project, we have the events already specified and the modules, the chapters in the book. However, in an MCD effort, we convert modules to lessons. That signifies that we're now going to get real and develop or buy the content for this. So a module becomes a lesson. We also enable the designers at this stage to take perhaps the four modules of the event and create six lessons out of them, or take the four modules of the event and create two lessons out of them. Now that we're very serious about creating this content or purchasing it, we might look harder at the design and reconfigure it. So we allow that freedom and flexibility here because we were using the events and the modules earlier simply to allow the business decision making of what priorities there were and is it worthy of us to pay for the development or acquisition of this content. Now that we're really going to do the design and develop this content or buy it, we really need to take a harder look at this. So we, we offer flexibility here to the designers. They would take the events and the module specifications and create lesson specifications and maps and instructional activity specs. We'll come back to all of this later on in the examples. Once we have the design done and we have a gate review meeting where the client signs off to, yes, that's the configuration, that's how you're going to do it, it's in that sequence, that's about how long the first part is going to take and the second part and the third part, and they buy into all of that stuff, you're ready to move into the development and acquisition phase. You may develop some content, you might acquire it. You might already have it elsewhere in the corporation as we've already determined. You may use it as is. You may have to modify it. You may have to go buy something from another vendor. As always, it depends. And this is where it's all put together. The goal of phase four development acquisition is to build the content that will be pilot tested in the fifth phase. In the pilot test, our goal is a full destructive test. If we can bring together the target audience and management representatives into a pilot test. We are going to deliver the content as we would going in the future, but our goal here is to see if we can break it. Is the design, is the content that was developed robust to the needs? Does this meet the needs? Can people master the performance so that it has a prayer of transferring to the job? 
So that's what the pilot test proves. And anything that's not quite right that comes out of the pilot test and the evaluations and the observations of the pilot, depending on how it was delivered, deployed, in the sixth phase, revision is done based on the results of the pilot test or tests, and then it is released. The content is put into the learning content management system, the learning management system, or into the metal file drawers so that the people that are going to do the delivery, the deployment, can go get them and use them going forward. Key to a modular curriculum development project is the development of a map, an event map. And just like a map of a country is then a map of the states, an event map is of the lessons. So in this example here, there are multiple lessons within this event. For example, that lesson can be specified now on a lesson map and again, that lesson map is of instructional activities, the next level in the design of MCD. There's events, there's lessons, and there's instructional activities. So that third instructional activity on the lesson map can be specified, and this is where all of the content of the analysis efforts ended up. Here's where all the tasks and the outputs and the gaps and all of that and the enabling knowledge and skills and any existing content that we're going to reuse, it's all resident then on the instructional activity specification or what we call the activity spec. Not to be too confusing, but there are three levels of design in MCD and IAD, Modular Curriculum Development and Instructional Activity Development. Now there are three levels of design in the PAC processes but when you go to the bottom two of those, there's three levels, events, lessons, and instructional activities. We could have gone farther, but we decided not to. This is the information that would be given to the developers to develop the content. It would tell them what is going to be developed exactly, what content they're going to be dealing with when they do those developments, what sequence it's going to flow in, etc. The holy grail of reuse. I've been working on reuse of content since 1981 before I started doing curriculum architecture design projects. So it's a major driver of me. The tool set that I use includes the five-tier inventory structure of content, part of an enterprise content architecture, and with the concept of maps and lessons and instructional activities. Reuse, unfortunately, was driven into a ditch with the concept of the reusable learning object. An intact course or lesson that was itself not a modular in its own design. That's where I differ. My lessons are comprised of modules which are, in fact, the instructional activities, which themselves can be looked at as modules, as elements, as components. There may be pictures and diagrams that are reused over and over again in multiple instructional activities, therefore in multiple lessons, and perhaps even in multiple events. So it's all about these objects and how we classify them. For example, these instructional activities, the how-to, complete a travel and expense report. What tier would that go into? The design of that content or the actual content after it's produced? Where would we have stored that so that somebody can find that later on? Because completing a travel expense report is something that many different jobs inside an enterprise might require. How to evaluate a training program however, is quite unique to some jobs, and that's not shareable. So is where the first how-to would be in Tier 4, shareable performance how-tos. The how-to evaluate a training program might be unique to one job, and therefore it would reside in Tier 5, a unique performance how-to. Active listening, good since the days of Socrates, just avoid that hemlock stuff, uh, 
is an enabling knowledge and skill. And therefore, you would find that content in Tier 3. An overview of instructional design, if you thought of that as the tasks and outputs of instructional design, would be found in Tier 2 of the Enterprise Content Architecture and the five-tier inventory structure. Welcome to the ABC Business Unit is something that you would find in Tier 1, part of the organizational orientations of the PAC processes. Do you agree? Let's look at some other content. Spreadsheets. Generic spreadsheet training. Spreadsheets which would be necessary to how to complete a travel expense report, depending on the tool that's used to complete an expense report, would be in a, a generic enabler, and that would be found in Tier 3. Statistics which would be used in evaluating a training program would be a Tier 3 set of content, shareable with many different terminal performance sets of content. Handling complaints is something that many jobs in an enterprise might have to do. Ask every manager if they have to handle complaints. Not just the people at the complaint window. That content would be in Tier 3. Active listening and handling complaints are enabling content that would allow somebody to do the terminal performance of their job. Writing instructional objectives is unique to instructional designers and therefore would be part of a Tier 5 set of how-to content. And welcome to the ABC Business Unit is a Tier 1 organizational orientation. I hope this has been helpful. How that would play out in a lesson map for handling XYZ in your job with learning objectives, which is given ABC, you're able to do XYZ as measured by 1, 2, 3 under both sunny skies and torrential rain conditions. There would always be an open and a close, where in the open is an advanced organizer that demystifies and lays out how we're going to get through this particular lesson. What's the point? How does this connect to the things previous? How does this connect to things downstream in the learning? As well as the close, which summarizes this. If you think of the old saw of, in presentations, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, the open is tell them what you're going to tell them, and the close is tell them what you told them. Then the rest of the content in between those two elements are the tell them. In this case, perhaps there's information now on generic XY, which would come from Tier 3. Then there's specific XY, which is in your job context, learner. This is how that plays out. So there's a generic part of XY and a specific part of XY. If you thought of active listening, there's active listening, generic content, good for everybody. But then how it plays out in the XYZ performance might be slightly different, might be nuanced. This is how, where, how we cover that. The next thing then is a demonstration of how that XY plays out in the specific context of this particular learner. So this is what XY looks like. And we can demonstrate it. We can do a slow motion demonstration on video and point out the various nuanced portions of this because that's what the learner needs to learn. That's what they need to master. And then we can have an application exercise, an authentic application exercise, that is replicable of their real-world performance requirements, their job tasks, producing the outputs that they produce, and we can have an application exercise on that. But wait a minute, this only covers X and Y out of the handling X, Y, Z. So we need to now add in the generic components, if there are such, for the Z portion of this, 
and then again talk about how z factors into x and y and becomes x, y, z, and we can demonstrate that through slow motion video or role plays up in the front of the room with actors who know what they're doing, etc. And then we can do an application exercise of how to do X, Y, Z. But wait, maybe that was just under the sunny skies condition. And we need to add another exercise where we throw in all the real world complexity and all the real difficulty there and have an exercise that follows on doing specific X, Y, Z in the pouring rain. And then it's time to close the lesson out, reflect on what we've learned, how this fits into the bigger picture, what this then leads to next in the learning continuum. So the five-tier inventory structure contains both generic content and specific content, active listening and the generics of active listening, and active listening in your job where you have to do interviews of subject matter experts and master performance and clients, and it's very different than everybody else's specific application of active listening, as one example. But we also might have then specific active listening for one particular job, the original content, and then somebody might come along next month or next year and create another derivative of that active listening because they're doing something very close to what our first learner's application was, but there are some different nuances that we need to change, and so now we can create a derivative of that. Maybe it only needs a 5% tweak from that original specific content, 5% difference, and now we've got exactly what that next learner population needs. So our inventory of content needs to account for all of these types of content, the generic stuff, the generic stuff made specific, and the different variations of specific content. Active listening is not active listening for every job in the corporation. However, almost all jobs, if not all jobs, require active listening. The performance context is different. The PAC processes have been doing this for clients since the early 1980s. Reuse of content is not a theory. It has been proven time and time again. But why bother with all of this? Well, for the return on investment. Research shows that only 5 to 15 percent of the population can learn out of context and apply to another context. So if you teach me active listening and it's not authentic enough to my specific application, the chances are I will not be able to learn it in your learning experience and then apply it on their job. I may master level two learning objectives but it may never transfer, and we'll determine that if we measure level three, does it transfer to the job. The way to ensure higher levels of transfer to the job is to make sure that what we teach, we teach in an authentic manner for the ROI. But there, wait, there's more. In our enterprise content architecture, we might also want to store our training and development paths, all the specifications and maps that we create for events and for modules, our lesson and activity specs, our existing training assessment data, or do we let every last instructional designer keep that on their hard drives of their computer, or do we have that in some shared space where it's accessible to all? That is a business decision and an organization lives with the consequences for how they handle this. There's also a need to store the product inventory, our shared events, our unique events, etc. And we might have all the derivatives for other organizations, so we, have a, we need a way to store and organize all of this content, not just the designs and the blueprints, but the actual content and all of the variations. If we're going to manage 
our organization like a business and we're in the product business of producing learning content or training content, whatever you want to call it, we should have a handle, we should have our arms around all this content and how we organize it and how we actually manage it in order to reduce our life cycle costs. And there's also legacy content, non-packed design, stuff that was bought or built years before and we're not going to blow it up and remodulize it and do all of those things. It's not necessary. We'll use it as is. We need to be able to account for that as well. And when we first start out embracing the pack process, there's going to be more of that kind of content than our events and modules and lessons and instructional activities designed kind of content. There's also a need for us to store miscellaneous kind of items, like all the pictures for all the executives and all the buildings we operate in and all of our products and things like that. So that goes into what I call the well. The well is where I would store all of those kinds of elements. There's lessons learned from all the projects. Where will we store all of that? There's best practices that we feel that might be considered going forward on other projects. Not to be used exactly as is, but just to learn from the best practices of other groups to see if we can use them as is or after modification. And there's all sorts of external data resources that a learning or training and development organization uses. Where shall we store that to make it more easily accessible for our people? The content for the Enterprise Content Architecture, and specifically the five-tier inventory, comes from the performance data on the left and from the enabling knowledge and skill data on the right, plus any existing content that we can use as is or after modification. This is reuse via the PAC processes for training and development, learning, and knowledge management. Now let's look at instructional activity development, a subset of modular curriculum development. Instructional activity development uses the same six-phase structure. Yes, some can be combined, such as if a CAD project happened before, you might combine the analysis and design phase into one phase and not have to do very much there because you've already done it previously. Or no, this may be brand new because what you're going to be building for the client to meet their most immediate needs wasn't preceded by a curriculum architecture design effort. The kinds of outputs, and this is not an all-inclusive list, but we could be building instructional content at the awareness, at the knowledge, and at the skill levels. We can make people aware of welding, we can make them very knowledgeable about welding and how to tell a good one from a bad one, or we can actually teach them how to weld. Three different types levels of content. We might build a knowledge test, paper and pencil if you will, or on the computer. We might be building performance tests, which is actually asking people to demonstrate the performance for us as we use criterion to determine whether or not they did it well enough, safely enough, etc. We might be building simulation exercises. We might be building performance or job aids. We could be building desk procedures that are going to be printed out on pages in front of the performers or on their computer systems in some fashion. Again, instructional activity development is a subset of a modular curriculum development effort. It meets the client's most immediate needs. I've done projects in the past where we did a curriculum architecture design effort and then instilled, instead of building any of the content, all we built were all the performance tests. The client was then going to administrate those to determine what content to really build. But because they had tied the performance tests to a pay progression program, all of the learner performers decided that, hmm, in order to get a pay raise, I'm going to have to pass these performance tests. I'll learn this informally. I'll look at the manuals. I'll ask my neighbor. I'll figure it out, pass those tests, get the pay raise. And the client then decided that they really didn't need to build any of the content. All they needed to build was the guidance of the training and development path and build the performance tests, which were open book tests that everybody could look at before they actually went to take the test. 
That's just one example. Next, let's look at analysis. We've been talking about doing the design based on having all the analysis data. Now let's take a look at the analysis. There are again four types of analysis data. The target audience data, the performance data, the enabling knowledge and skills data, and the existing training and development assessments data. Depending on our familiarity with the target audience, I mean if we've addressed their needs 27 times in the past, we may not need to do anything on this because we know the target audience inside and out, the project steering team knows the target audience inside and out, and we'll make decisions based on our understanding of the target audience, based on that prior knowledge, and we don't need to go dig up new. But if this is a brand new target audience that we've not addressed before, we may need to know what's the body count. How many of them are there? And then where are they? Are there a thousand people in one building or three buildings? across the planet or are they in 500 offices in onesies and twosies and threesies and that's where the target audience is. Any good marketeer would understand the customer base and where they are because you're going to have to make decisions about how you distribute the product to them based on where they are. What's the turnover rates? Is this organization growing or shrinking? Is it growing in certain areas and shrinking in others or vice versa? What, what is it that we know about them? What can we safely assume about their incoming knowledge and skills? Are they all electrical engineers and therefore they won't need to be taught AC, DC electrical theory? Which is necessary for doing the job performance, but hey, they're already degreed electrical engineers, they already know that. Or no, there are some people coming into the job that are electrical engineers, but there's another portion of them that aren't. And so we're going to have to include AC, DC electrical theory in the curriculum. But we shouldn't modularize and eventize that content in such a way that degreed engineers are going to have to go through that content. We need to modularize that and package that content so that the electrical engineer can skip that. And we might ask them to test out of AC, DC electrical theory or we'll just believe because they have the engineering degree that they don't need it we might save our testing out dollars for other things that aren't so obvious. The second part of the analysis data is to look at performance. The first thing we would do is organize our view of performance into what I call areas of performance. These are also known as major duties, key results areas, many different labels for this concept. ADDI is a set of areas of performance. DMAIC from the Six Sigma world is a set of areas of performance. New product de development efforts always are framed in various phases. Many things for your customer already have this concept. They may in fact already have a set of area performances that covers their world of performance without any overlaps or any gaps, which is the goal of the areas of performance, is to minimize or eliminate overlaps and gaps as we analyze deeper. So in this example, there's a staff recruiting selection and training of a TMC store manager. Then there's work scheduling. Then there's progressive discipline and store operations, etc., etc. These are the various elements that their job contains. Remember this staff recruiting selection A out of the A through G elements of areas of performance. When we take A, staff recruiting, we can now begin to look at well, what are the outputs and what are the measures for those outputs. How do we know a good output from a bad one? What are the earmarks, the measures, the metrics, and standards, if we have them, for that output? What are the key tasks associated with that output? In the PAC processes, when we do task analysis, it's always within the context of an output. And we look at outputs, it's always within the context of an area of performance. Now for those tasks, we can begin to look at, well, what are the roles and responsibilities? Who's doing task one, two, three, four, etc.? How does that play out? Is there more than one job title involved in any task? And so we can have some clarity around the roles and responsibilities of, in this case, the district manager, the store manager, the assistant manager, and the store clerk. And we can see in that first task that the store manager and the assistant manager can do that first task.
but all the rest of the tasks are the province of the store manager. We don't have assistant managers do that. That's not part of their job expectations. The left-hand side of a performance model articulates and captures ideal performance as articulated, as conceded to, by the master performers that are brought together in the analysis team efforts. The right-hand side constitutes a gap analysis up against the ideal performance on the left-hand side. So where we know that what we want is timely and qualified candidates on the left, we can find that we have too few candidates and that's one of the typical performance gaps. Not an atypical performance gap, but a typical performance gap. Happens all the time. This is our signal that the incumbent population is struggling with certain areas of performance and therefore this may not be as easy as it might seem because the incumbent population hasn't informally learned this well enough that it's a problem. It's a typical problem. And so what are some of the probable gap causes? Because we're limited in our time for an analysis team meeting of two or three or four days, we cannot do root cause analysis on this thing. So what we're asking is for what are the probable gap causes here? What do the master performers in the room on the analysis team think is this? And they'll give us their probable gap causes and then we can attribute each one of those causes to whether it's a deficiency in the environmental supports or whether it's a deficiency of the knowledge and skill of those performers, they just don't know, or it's a deficiency of their individual attributes and values. They don't have the physical attributes, the psychological attributes, the intellectual attributes, or the personal values in order to do the job. We're asking them to be a team member, but we didn't hire team players. Hmm. Or we're asking them to physically handle heavy objects and do that eight hours a day, but we've not hired for that. So there's implications here in what are the causes of the gaps and what can training do about them. Understanding these deficiencies and their causes helps the client understand what training can or cannot do for them. This is why I don't try to talk clients out of training I follow what Joe Harless taught me back in the 80s, is when a client asks you for training, you don't say in your whiniest voice, are you sure you got a training problem? He taught us to say yes, and I can help you even more if you'll allow us to do some analysis quickly. And this is my approach to doing analysis quickly. Assemble a group of master performers together, have them articulate the ideal performance and the gaps and the causes of those gaps and be on a shared journey with them so later on we can all understand what training will actually do for us and what it won't do for us. Where are their issues with the process, the environmental supports, our hiring practices that are causing us these issues? Now I also use the content on the right hand side of the performance model as fodder for those exercises and the application exercises. How did I know that you needed to be able to do this under sunny skies and in torrential rain? It would have come from the right-hand side of the performance model. Because some master performers have figured out how to do this in torrential rain, but others haven't. They forgot to bring their umbrella or something. The third part of analysis data are the enabling knowledge and skills. In order to perform, you need to know certain things. You have to have certain skills like mastering a spreadsheet and things like that so that you can apply that into the authentic performance of doing a budget. We use the knowledge and skill matrices then to tie per category to the areas of performance. So for example, I know that when I need EEO a company policy procedure, I need it when I'm doing part A of my job, but not the rest of it. When I'm doing affirmative action, the same thing. But when I understand and implement the vacation and days off policies, I'm doing that in four different parts of my job. Later on, when we assess existing content, if we have some content on vacation policies and day off policies, we can look to see whether or not it's generic or whether it touches on the applications that are necessary when I'm doing part A, B, C, and D of my job. Because we might have some content on that, 
but it may not go far enough, leaving a gap. That fourth type of analysis data is the existing training and development assessment data. Once we understand, ideally, what performance we need to have done by the performers, the learners, and what gaps and causes of gaps they need to wrestle with and learn to anticipate and avoid, or if unavoidable, deal with, and what the enabling knowledge and skills are that enable one to perform, we can do a better job of assessing the existing content, whether that's instructional content or informational content, as to whether or not we can reuse it. Can we reuse it as is, or after modification, or what we've got may be appropriate for other jobs, but isn't appropriate for the job that we're targeting in this effort. We do analysis without paralysis. Part of the PAC processes, and the acronym is A for accelerated. We accelerate through this because we facilitate analysis teams and design teams. We use subject matter experts where necessary. We use master performers always. We may use novice performers if we need to have the insight of people that are newer to the job. We may use management and supervisory personnel if we feel that the current master performers don't understand the future state that we're striving to get to and we need to bring in them or other subject matter experts that represent new tools that are coming down the pike and we need to anticipate those and build that into the future curriculum. We use a facilitated approach, a group process for this. However, these efforts can also be accomplished via traditional individual analyses, interviews, and document reviews and observations, but at increased costs and cycle times. It is a business decision to bring people together. And if that's not feasible, and it isn't always feasible, then we would go the traditional route and do the observations and the interviews and review documents and build our analysis data that way and then assess the existing content against that. The heart of the PAC processes analysis methodologies is the performance model which allows you to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills per the 17 categories of knowledge and skills. This content from the performance model and the knowledge and skill matrices is what feeds the enterprise content architecture and that portion that is the five-tier inventory framework. The PAC tool and other resources, I use an access database that I've been using since the early 90s, the PAC tool. It captures and produces all of the project planning data and reports, the analysis data and reports, the design data and reports, it produces all the project steering team gate review meeting invitations, the communications, the presentations. It does everything up to the development of the content using whatever authoring tool or tools that you have and feeds the learning content management systems or learning management systems that you might have in place. Or if you don't have any of that, you don't have authoring tools, and you're creating instructor-led training, it will feed the development of content using PowerPoint and Word documents. Let's now move into project planning and management. The key thing is the detailed project plan. In the narrative section of it, there's this purpose statement, there's background as to why we're doing this and why, why now, there's a scope, what's included, what's not included, what's the approach that we're going to be using, are we going to be using surveys or not, what are the project phases and milestones, are there four phases in the CAD project, or are there six phases in the MCD project, what are the specific outputs and deliverables, what are the various roles and responsibilities going through the project, and then the eighth portion is the project tasks, roles, and schedules. An example page is on the right-hand side of the screen, where we list all the tasks by phase, 
And we identify for all the players, the instructional design team and all the client team folks, how much touch time they're going to incur as we go through the project. And then we can add all that up and determine what the costs are, if we're going to price this, or how we're going to schedule this, etc. PACT, again, is an acronym for performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder-driven training and development. The C could have stood for collaboration, but I wanted it to be stronger than a collaborative effort. I wanted to indicate in these processes here that the client and stakeholders drive the process. We're all working for them. We want to be client and stakeholder driven and really put the clients and the stakeholders in the driver's seat in these collaborative efforts. Collaborating and collaboration doesn't indicate that nuanced approach where we are working for them. ISD owns the processes, but the clients own the content. And if the client needs us to change the processes, we will do that too. We are going to be working for them. They live with the consequences of the success or failures of our efforts. They are in the driver's seat in the PAC processes. We accomplish this through the gate review meetings it gives us a forum to come together to tell them what we're going to do going forward, what we've gathered thus far, if we've changed our mind about any of our precepts going forward into the project, etc. It allows us to bring to the effort our instructional design expertise, where we can truly share with them what works and what doesn't, but leave the business decisions as to whether or not we do that and we follow an ideal path or a more real and feasible path to meet their needs. The project steering team, in my approach when clients ask about this, is to think about who might come out of the woodwork over the course of our project and take exception to what we're doing and how we're doing it. We should have probably involved them beginning on day one. And so that's the intent. Who are all the stakeholders besides the client? Who else has a stake in our success or failure? Who needs to be in the know about how we're approaching this because it might affect what they're doing because they're upstream from us or downstream from us? These are tricky decisions, but this enables us to wire into the politics of the organization whether you like politics or not, you're going to have to learn how to deal with the po political situation. And this is how we do that, through the gate review meetings where we meet with the project steering team and let them drive the project. PACT, as it's defined in the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, way back in the early 1980s, was that PACT is a noun. It's a formal agreement, a bargain. I like that. It's where we, ISD suppliers, can meet and partner with our ISD customers. Three levels of instructional design in the PAC processes to help us meet our clients' requirements. A curriculum of modules is not the same as a modular curriculum. In PACT, we use a PACT logic. It's rather complex, but most of the time we're dealing with a complex situation, which will require a somewhat complex solution. Our PACT process data logic ties performance analysis of various types to curriculum architecture design, which ties to the modular curriculum development and the subset of instructional activity development to build an engineered set of instructional and informational products. But when training isn't the answer, or ain't the answer, the PAC processes through the analysis methodologies can lead to a different approach, a broader approach to performance than instruction, 
which is what the PAC processes are. It's about training and development. However, in our analysis approach, when we look at the gaps, and we see that some of the gaps of performance are outside the realm of knowledge and skill deficits, and therefore can't be fixed through instruction, what else can we do? Well, we can use the big picture of EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. We can, it's scalable, we can look up and down the enterprise and the function and the departments, we can look at individual processes, we can systematically derive what are the enablers. It's the process itself or it's the human assets, of which awareness, knowledge, and skills are just one set of the assets that the humans bring to the process. They also bring their physical attributes, their psychological attributes, their intellectual attributes, and their personal values. But there's also the environment, the data and information, material supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount, and the culture and consequence system that the humans interact with, perform within. But there's also then the process. If the process has not been designed to meet the stakeholder requirements, it doesn't matter what human assets are available and what environmental assets are available it's doomed to failure. As Gary Rumler, the late Gary Rumler said, put a good performer in a bad system and the system wins every time. We're trying to avoid that in the PAC processes and the EPI processes. The PAC processes enable you to address your client's needs at any level, at the path level, at the event level, at component levels. Maybe they just need performance tests to tie to a pay progression program. But it also helps us help the client avoid instruction, training, learning that isn't going to move the needles anywhere positive other than the expense needle. If you're interested in performance-based instruction and information, I suggest you explore further the PAC processes for training and development. There are seven business reasons for embracing the PAC processes. The first is to increase performance impact. That would be due to the use of the performance modeling with master performers. The second is to increase the reuse of modular designs and modular content. That's due to the use of the PAC logic architectural rules and guidelines for instructional activities, lessons and modules, events, paths and the use of the five tier inventory frameworks. The third reason is to reduce the development time and costs. This is due to the increased use of content as is and after modification. You're not always starting at ground zero with a blank sheet of paper or a blank computer screen. The fourth reason is to reduce the inventory system costs. Because you're increasing the reuse of content as is and tracking derivatives after modification, you can decrease your inventory system costs. You'll have less content in inventory, less redundant content, inadvertent redundant content. The fifth reason is to reduce the administrative costs, and that's due to the reduced complexity and increased flexible organization of all of your content using the five-tier inventory structure, etc. The sixth reason is to reduce the deployment system costs. That's due to your use of alternative deployment methods when appropriate that increase local flexibility for training, remediation, refresh, and refreshers. Spaced learning is what leads to increased performance competence through better recall. The seventh reason reducing your maintenance system costs. If you're reducing your inadvertent redundancy and you're tracking redundancy by design, you will have less to maintain. And you can maintain it in one place on one set of content for multiple reuses. But there's an eighth business reason for embracing the PAC processes. When your analysts and project planners and managers can plan and conduct instructional efforts, and specifically the analysis, and think beyond instruction to assess the other elements,
contributions or inhibitions to peak performance. They can begin the journey from training to performance improvement consulting using the PACT and the EPI methodologies. There are five methodology sets in the PACT processes with three levels of instructional design and common analysis and project planning and management methods, tools, and techniques. I have many free resources on my website, including some podcasts that were done in 2007. Lean ISD, the book, is available as a hardback and a paperback through Amazon.com, but is also available as a free 410-page PDF on my website. There's many articles and chapters and columns and audio podcasts and video podcasts on these methodologies. Go for more at the Resources tab at epic.biz. There's other resources, including the six-pack books that were updated in 2011 from the Lean ISD book, which was published in 1999 after several years of intense effort of writing that. These new books are available as both paperbacks and as Kindles. The Curriculum Manager's Handbook, the original title for what became Lean ISD, is available again as a paperback and a Kindle book. It is for managers in particular. The Analysis of Performance Competence Requirements is for practitioners, the analysts, in case you have specialists, people doing just analysis and not doing everything as a generalist. The next book is Performance-Based Curriculum Architecture Design. Again, that's for the practitioners. Another book is Performance-Based Modular Curriculum Development. This is for the designers, again, for the practitioners. Another book is Management Areas of Performance Competence. When you're looking at managerial performance and their curricula, this is for the analysts and designers at the practitioner level. Wrapping up the series, the six books, is the book From Training to Performance Improvement Consulting. This is for managers. These six books are intended to help you go from training to performance improvement consulting. There are other resources, such as my consulting services. I can work and do the project efforts for CAD or MCD and IAD with you or alone. I've also been doing staff development since 1984 with many Fortune 500 companies, teaching the project planning and management methods and tools, the analysis methods and tools, the curriculum architecture design methods and tools, the MCD and IED design methods and tools, etc. I've also worked with clients to help them redesign their instructional design processes, their versions of ADDI. For staff development, I have both formal workshops for practitioners and I have less formal coaching sessions as well. When we're doing staff development, sometimes clients are interested in certifying the performance, competence, and capabilities of their staff. I have this arranged into five key roles. The PPA, the Performance Analyst, the PCD, the CAD Designer, the PMD, the MCD and IED Designer, the PLD, which is the Lead Developer, and the PPM, the Project Manager. Most of the time, we're targeting to get people to a level three in the six levels of certification. That indicates that they have the ability to go solo. I've also been involved in PAC process technology transfer efforts where clients wanted to embrace all of this and implement the tools and the processes and do the staff development necessary to fully embrace the PAC processes. There's a five-stage process for approaching this. 
Why pact? Gary Rummler said it in 1999. If you want to ground your fantasy of a corporate university with the reality of a sound engineering approach to instructional systems that will provide results, you should learn about the PAC processes. If you are the leader of or a serious participant in the design and implementation of a large-scale corporate curriculum, then this book and these methods are for you. This system could be the difference between achieving bottom-line results with your training or being just another little red schoolhouse. Mickey Lane, who I know from my years at ISPI, also wrote in 1999, Lean ISD takes all the theory, books, courses, and pseudo-job aids that are currently on the market about instructional system design and blows them out of the water. Previous systems approaches showed a lot of big boxes and diagrams which were supposed to help the reader become proficient in the design process. Here is a book that actually includes all of the information that fell through the cracks of other ISD training materials and shows you the way to actually get from one step to another. Guy adds all the caveats and tips he has learned in more than 20 years of ISD practice and sprinkles them as job aids and stories throughout the book. However, the most critical part of the book for me was that Guy included the project and people management elements of ISD in the book. Too often, ISD models and materials forget that we are working with real people in getting the work done. This book helps explain and illustrates best practices in ensuring success in ISD projects. Why Pact? For the ROI.